بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد النبي الأمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So today inshallah our lecture is about Al-Udhiyah, the sacrifice that takes place in the Muslim holiday, Eid Al-Adha Al-Mubarak. Inshallah tonight is the first session of the lecture and this coming Thursday will be the second session because I want to split the lectures, the lecture to two uh, sessions. Today is the first one and the next one is Thursday. I was supposed to do it Tuesday because our classes are Sunday, Tuesday and Thursday. But inshallah on Tuesday I'm going to talk about the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah and their greatness. Because the first day of Dhul Hijjah inshallah is going to be uh, this Friday, September 2nd. September 2nd is going to be the first day of Dhul Hijjah according to the calendar. But in this message we are following the the, the, the moon sighting that conducted them in Saudi Arabia. So the moon sighting could be different than the calendar. So inshallah that's going to be clear by this Thursday. Thursday inshallah the 1st of September everything is going to be clear but as now according to the calendar September the 2nd which is this Friday is the first day of the Hijjah and Al Eid the, the Eid holiday inshallah Eid Al-Adha Al-Mubarak will be 9-11 September 11 Sunday and the day of Arafah inshallah is going to be Saturday uh, it's going to be Saturday which is uh, September 10th September 10th Saturday inshallah is going to be the day of Arafah, the greatest day in the whole year. So this Tuesday, I'm going to be talking about the first 10 days of the Hijjah and their greatness. And this coming Thursday, inshallah, will be the second session of this lecture, Al-Udhiyah, بإذن المولى عز وجل. فبإذن الله يا أخواني, محاضرتنا لهذا اليوم عن الأضاحي. عن الأضاحي التي تكون في عيد الفطر عيد الأضحى المبارك. وبإذن الله سيكون ستكون المحاضرة على شقين أو على قسمين اليوم هو اليوم الأول أو القسم الأول من المحاضرة والقسم الثاني بإذن الله سيكون يوم الخميس يوم الخميس القادم سأكمل الجزء الثاني من هذه المحاضرة يوم الثلاثاء سأتكلم عن العشر الأولى من شهر ذي الحجة نعلم أنه المحاضرات الأحد ثم الثلاثاء ثم الخميس والمفترض أني أكمل الجزء الثاني من هذا الموضوع يوم الثلاثاء القادم لكن بسبب أننا نريد أن نشحد هممنا وأن نتحمس للعشر الأولى من ذي الحج فبإذن الله سأتكلم عنها يوم الثلاثاء القادم ويوم الخميس بإذن الله نتناقش فيما بقي من الشق الثاني من الأضاحي بإذن المولى عز وجل طبعا بإذن الله العيد سيكون يوم سبتمبر 11 يوم السبت أو يوم الأحد بعد القادم بإذن الله حسب التقويم طبعا نحن هنا في هذا المسجد نتبع الرؤية التي تعقد في المملكة العربية السعودية فإذا خالفت الرؤية التقويم فهذا سيتغير لكن الآن بإذن الله كما هو في التقويم العيد سيكون يوم الأحد الموافق, الموافق لسبتمبر الحادي عشر بإذن الله ويوم عرفة يوم الوقفة سيكون يوم العاشر من سبتمبر الذي هو يوم السبت بإذن المولى عز وجل فمحاضرتنا للثلاثاء القادم ستكون عن العشر الأولى من ذي الحجة وبركة يوم عرفة وعظم عبادة الله سبحانه وتعالى فيه. So إن شاء الله our lecture is about al the sacrifice. In this lecture إن شاء الله I'm going to talk about three things. Three things are going to be discussed in tonight's lecture. So the first thing is the ruling of Islam in al-Udhiya, what its hukum. And then I'm going to talk about the conditions of al-Udhiya. We have four conditions that has to be fulfilled in order for the Udhiya to be acceptable. To be acceptable. And then I'm going to talk about prohibited things for the person who's having the intention to do Al-Udhiya. From the first day of the Hijjah, this Friday, inshallah, September 2nd, if you are having the intention to do Al-Udhiya, the sacrifice, there are certain things that are prohibited for you to do. I'm going to talk about that, inshallah, in this lecture, بإذن المولى عز وجل. So before we go deep in this subject, we have to understand the greatness of sacrifice, slaughtering animals. This is not something that only found in Islam. It's something that practiced by prophets that, come, uh, that came before the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in all believing nations who came before us. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَلِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ جَعَلْنَا مَنْ سَكَنْ لِيَذْكُرُ اسْمَ اللَّهِ عَلَى مَا رَزَقَهُمْ مِنْ بَهِيمَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ For any nation, we make mansak. Mansak meaning a place in a certain time for slaughtering for any believing nations. 
and a believing nation. And all those who came before us, they were practicing this ibadah, this righteous deeds. لِيَذْكُرُوا اسْمَ اللَّهِ To mention Allah's name عَلَىٰ مَا رَزَقَهُمْ For the blessing of the cattle that He has given to them. So this is something that practiced by all believing nations that came before us, including us. And this is one of the greatest righteous deeds that will make you get closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also it's a bliss, blessing for us to feel the greatest worship that's taking place in Mecca al Mukarrama, the Holy City. We know during the, uh, from the 8th of the Hijjah, the 8th of the Hijjah, which is uh, the, the, the following Friday, the following Friday, which is the 9th of September, the 8th of the Hijjah, all the way going to the 13th of the Hijjah, is the time that people, uh, people perform the Hajj. So those who are blessed and those who are given the opportunity by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be there, they are enjoying the moment and they are having the opportunity to change all of their past. We know that no way for you. Uh, there is no any aspect in the life that will allow you to erase or to change your past. But Islam does that. How? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us different opportunities for our sins to be forgiven. One of them is Al-Hajj, the person who does a clean and pure hajj, his reward is that he will become in terms of sins, zero of sins, just the same way as the day that his mother delivered him, the day that his mother bore him and brought him to this life. So this is a great opportunity to change your past. And we have a lot of opportunities to change your past Islamically. For example, the tawbah, the repentance. When you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah changed the evil and the sins you have been in the past, and he will make it as a reward in hasanat. So those who are in Mecca, who worship in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and being blessed and having the opportunity to perform Al-Hajj, we share them, we share the moments with them. So we do sacrifice, which is something that they do in there during the, 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 the process of Al-Hajj. And also we share them in something they do. Uh, or we share them in one of the for, uh, forbidden things for them. Like cutting their nails and uh, cutting or shaving their hair. That's prohibited for them and also prohibited for the person who's doing the sacrifice. So sacrifice makes you feel the greatness of the Hajj and feels that uh, we have brothers who are there in doing the, this worship and that's going to encourage you to make the Hajj one of your top priorities one day to make the Hajj. So this is a great ni'mah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us feel some part of the worships that the believers do in Makkah al-Mukarramah, the, the, the hollow city, when they practice and perform Al-Hajj. طب يا اخواني الحج الاضحية عفوا قبل ان نتكلم عن احكامها وعن تفاصيلها وعن ما يتعلق بها من احكام لابد ان نعلم انها من اعظم السنن لماذا؟ لانها سنة لنا وسنة لمن كان قبلنا فالانبياء والامم التي وجدت قبلنا كان هذا امر موجودا عندهم فالله يقول ولكل امة جعلنا منسكا منسكا مكانا يذبحون فيه ووقتا معينا يذبحون فيه ليذكروا اسم الله على ما رزقهم من بهيمة الأنعام وأيضا الأضحية نعمة من نعم الله سبحانه وتعالى فنتذكر إخواننا الذين في مكة الذين يقيمون شعائر الله ويحجون إلى بيت الله الحرام فنشاركهم في الذبح لأن الذبح مما يفعله الحاج المتمتع أو القارن يسوقون الهدي ثم يذبحون في مكة فنحن أيضا نشاركهم في هذا فنذبح الأضاحي وأيضا نشاركهم في بعض ما حرم عليهم فمما حرم على المحرم أنه لا يقطع أظفاره ولا يقص شعره أو يحلقه فمن أراد الأضحية أيضا يحرم عليه ذلك من اليوم الأول من ذي الحجة إلى أن يضحي ويذبح أضحيته فنشاركهم في هذا ونشعر بعظمة الحج وذلك بإذن الله يشحد هممنا ويعلي أمرنا بإذن الله ويحمسنا للحج وأداء فريضة الإسلام التي هي الركن الخامس من أركان الدين طيب يا إخواني When we talk about the sacrifice Everybody knows about it And when we say sacrifice at Uqhiya Some people under, better understand it as Qurbani Especially those who speak Urdu What I notice is that They, they better understand it as Qurbani So it's the same thing Qurbani al Uqhiya sacrifice is the same thing The slaughtering that takes place In the day of Al-Eid In the tenth of the Hijjah So when we talk about al Uqhiya The sacrifice What is your idea about it? Is it an obligation? Is it sunnah? Is it something permissible? If you want to do it, you do it. If you don't want to do it, you're good. So who knows the hukum about al-udhiyah, ikhwan? Who has any idea about al-udhiyah? 
هاي اخواني من يعرف حكم الاضحيه هل هي واجبه هل هي مستحبه هل هي سنه هل هي مباحه لمن اراد ان يضحي ولمن اراد ان يتركها يتركها سنه طيب ان اذا انس انسر سو سيد السنه ذاتس جيد جود انسر ما في اجابه ثانيه يا اخواني ها Yeah, it's the sunnah for all prophets. I say that in the beginning. But we know that the ruling in our deen is different than the ruling of those who came before us. Something could be an obligation upon us, but it's not an obligation upon them. Or something could be the opposite. It's an obligation upon them, but it's not an obligation upon us. And in Islam, always when we talk about righteous deeds, al-ibadat, we always has, uh, we always have, alaykum as how to have to give it hukum, a ruling, anything, any worship. Any righteous deeds, it must take one of the five judgments or one of the five rulings in Al Fiqh al Islami. Wajib, Muharram, Mustahab, Makruh, Mubah. And I talk about that many, 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 many times in different classes. So, who can define Al Wajib? What Al Wajib means when we say something is Wajib, is an obligation. What does that mean? I'm not talking about you have to do it. We know that you have to do it, but we're talking about something deeper. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't do it, you are sinful. If you do it, you are rewarded. You have to do it, but if you don't do it, you are sinful. That's what the wajib means. So in any Islamic lecture, when we hear the speaker say, this is wajib, this is an obligation, meaning that you have to do it. If you don't do it, you are sinful. For example, the salat. It's wajib, you have to pray. If you don't pray, you are sinful. When we say muharram, haram, prohibited, forbidden, what does that mean? We know that it's something that you cannot do. We know that. But what, what we need the deeper meaning of it. What does that mean? Yeah, if you do it, you are sinful. If you don't do it, you are rewarded. Very important. If you don't do it, if you do it, you are sinful. That's what everybody knows. But if you avoid it, you are rewarded. I don't drink alcohol. I'm rewarded for that. I can't drink it, but I don't do it because I'm fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reward right there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you hasanat. Okay? And then we have the sunnah or al-mustahab. Who can define that? Ma ma'ana sunnah ikhwani? Yes. Yeah, if you do it, you are rewarded. If you don't do it, you're good. For example, the two rak'at we pray after salat al-maghrib. It's sunnah, it's mustahabah. You do it, but when we say sunnah, a lot of people, the way they take it, they don't do it. We know that it's not an obligation, but you should do it. You are highly recommended to do it. You are urged to do it. That the meaning of a sunnah or al-mustahab, al-makruh, something that's not recommended, something that is liked. What does that mean? What does that mean? Al-makruh, ya akhwani, ma ma'na? Lama naqul hadha al-amr makruh. مثلا تسمع محاضرة وال 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 والشيخ أو المحاضر يتكلم وقال هذا أمر مكروه طبعا نتكلم عن المحاضرات الشرعية يعني عندما نقول مكروه لغة مثلا شخص ليس محاضر في الدين وإنما محاضر في علم آخر وقال مكروه له معنى معين عندهم في فنهم وفي علمهم وفي اللغة العربية عامة عندما نقول أمر مكروه أنه أمر مستقبح لا يحسن لا يحسن أن تفعله هذا معناه لغة لكن شرعا في الصراح الفقهاء ما معناه لما نقول هذا الأمر مكروه when we say this is مكروه what does that mean anybody هاي الشيخ سليمان الشيخ حقا سير اجان ام سر ها Yeah, if you do it, you're not sinful. For example, coming to the masjid and jogging or running, this is makruh. But if you do it, you're not sinful. It's not prohibited. It's not haram. So you're not sinful. But if you avoid doing it, you are rewarded. You are rewarded. Because the Prophet Muhammad said, uh, uh, do not come to the salat jagging or running and come with uh, tranquility, being calm. So if you do that, you are rewarded. That's the meaning and the definition of al-makruh. So when we say something is makruh, it's not recommended. 
if you avoid it, you are rewarded. If you do it, you're so good. You're not, uh, you're not sinful. You're not sinful, but you're doing something that's not uh, that disliked and not recommended Islamically. And then the fifth hukum, the fifth ruling is mubah. When we say mubah, it's something permissible. Something permissible. Driving to work or sleeping, eating. It's something permissible Islamically. Now. Nah. اللي يجي من بيت ومشي ما يسعى يعني ما يسرع يجري فأتوا وعليكم السكينة فما أدركتم فصلوا وما فاتكم فأتموا بعض الناس لما يأتي للمسجد لأنه يخشى أن تفوته الركعة الأولى أو الثانية فيسرع يجري فهذا مكروه أن صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول وأتوها وعليكم السكينة فما أدركتم فصلوا الركعات التي أدركتها تصلي والذي فاتك تقضي لماذا لأنك لو جئ لو جئ تساعيا لن تكون مركزا في الركعة الأولى ستتنفس وعقلك يكون بعيدا تماما عن الصلاة فربما تدرك الأولى الركعة الأولى لكن تصلي بدون خشوع لكن إن أتيت بخشوع وهو هدوء تدرك الركعة الثانية وتفوت الركعة تفوتك الركعة الأولى لكنك تصلي بخشوع والخشوع هو لب الصلاة فهذا من المكروهات وأشياء كثيرة من المكروهات مثلا أكل البصل والمجيء إلى المسجد مكروه أو أكل أكل البصل والمجيء إلى المسجد مكروه so anyway, the makruh is something that's not recommended. If you do it, you're not sinful. If you avoid it, you are rewarded. The mubah is something that you can do it and you can abandon doing it. That's what al-mubah means. And al-mubah, you could, you could turn it to, 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 to something that will make you gain reward, to be rewarded. If I sleep early to wake up for salatul fajr, I'm rewarded. It's something that permissible, I'm doing it normally, but I receive reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the pure and clean intention I'm having uh, for, for the sleeping. I'm sleeping early to wake up for Salatul Fajr. If I'm late, I'm not going to wake up. So I get rewarded. I'm eating to be strong and, and I'm praying. You get rewarded. But all of that depends on the knee. I'm going to work to make money and provide for my fam family. You are rewarded. But all of that is linked with the niya. Your intention, your niya, what makes you receive reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or not receive it. So anyway, al udhiya ikhwani, its ruling is that it's sunnah. Sunnah, yukrahu ala al-qadiri tarquha. The person who is able to do it, the person who is capable of doing it, it is now recommended for him to, to, to abandon doing it. He should do it. But we have a Shaykh ibn Muhammad ibn Salih al Atameen, or Imam Abu Hanifa, and also Shaykh al Islam Ahmad ibn Taymiyyah, they say it's an obligation. You must do it. Because why? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, since he started doing it, he never abandoned doing it. He was doing it yearly. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Al-Quran Al-Kareem, we find some verses Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the salat, and right after the salat he mentions the sacrifice. And we know the importance of the salat, and it's an obligation. So they take from that that it's an obligation, because it's what mentioned with something that's obligatory, which is the salat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرُ Pray to your Lord, وَنْحَرُ Slaughter, sacrifice. So that means they, have, they share the same ruling. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Saying, meaning that, O oh Muhammad say, إِنَّ صَلَاتِي verily, my prayer, وَنُسُكِي in my uh, slaughtering, وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي My living in my dying, لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord of the whole world. So, the salat is mentioned right after that, النُسُك, الذبح, which is slaughtering. So some scholars say that it's an obligation, you have to do it as long as you have the ability, you have the, uh, the enough money to do it. So that's an obligation upon you. So anyway, the right thing is that it's sunnah, it's highly recommended to, recommended to do it. But if you cannot do it, it's not an obligation upon you. If you don't have the money, because it costs maybe three $300 to do it. But now everybody has it. Now everybody has it, and some people owe money. So if you owe money, what you should do to pay your debt? Because this is something dangerous to meet in having uh, in, in owing money for people. So if you owe people, do not do the sacrifice. Use that money towards your debt and pay off your debt. That's better for you. So the ruling for sacrifice is that it's sunnah. It's something that highly recommended for the person who is capable, who has the ability to do it. But if you do not have the ability, that's not an obligation upon you. طيب يا إخواني أنا تكلمت والمسألة واضحة يعني ال ال الوضح هي طبعا حكمه أنها سنة والعلماء قالوا يعني سنة يكره تركها ومن العلماء من قال بوجوبها ك 
شيخ الاسلام احمد بن تيميه والامام ابو حنيفه والشيخ محمد بن صالح العثيمين قالوا بوجوبها لماذا؟ لان الله قرن الذبح والنسك مع الصلاه فقال الله تبارك وتعالى فصل لربك وانحر صلي وانحر ونعلم وجوب الصلاه فمن اجل ذلك قالوا ايضا النحر واجب وايضا الله سبحانه وتعالى يقول قل ان صلاتي ونسكي ومحياي ومماتي لله رب العالمين فمن اجل ذلك كل هذا ذكرت الصلاه ثم ذكر النسك وهو الذبح فمن اجل ذلك هذا واجب ويجب على من يقدر ان يضحي يجب عليه وجوبا ان يضحي ان لم يضحي فهو اثم لكن القول الراجح انها سنه ولمن قدر عليها ومن تركها فقد ترك امرا عظيما النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم واظب وداوم عليه ان يصلى وسلم داوم على هذا فينبغي لمن كان آه لمن كان قادرا ان يفعل هذا ونحن اهل مكه غالبا ننساها ليس كذلك على احنا في مكه سبحان الله بسبب انشغالنا بالحج ننسى الاضحى وكثير من الناس للاسف يعني ما يضحون ينشغلون بالحج والعمل في الحج وسبحان الله يعني الناس لا يضحون لكن ليس كل الناس الناس المنشغلون باعمال الحج وكذا يعني يفوتهم هذا بسبب انشغالهم لكن عموما هذا امر مهم جدا وهذه من السنن اللواتي واظب عليه اللواتي واظب عليه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فينبغي ان نواظب عليها. Okay, something very important that we have to understand. Now we know al-udhiyah. When you do al-udhiyah, you do it for yourself and for all of your family. Right? As one sheep. And I'm going to talk about uh, what exactly you must slaughter in order to be acceptable. To be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, when you slaughter one sheep, that's for you in for all of your family. Let's suppose you have four wives and you have 100 children. So one sheep is for you and also for all of your wives and all of your children. Okay? But some people, what they do is that my father is dead and I'm doing that old here. So I'm going to slaughter one sheep for me and my family and I'm going to slaughter another sheep for my father who's dead. So I'm doing I'm doing I'm slaughtering one sheep that's for me and my family and also I'm slaughtering a second sheep and that for my father who's dead. Is that acceptable? Is that acceptable? That's not the right way to do it. Why? Because the Prophet Muhammad we know that there is a lot of people from his family were dead that time he was doing at Udhiya. For example, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, his uncle. But we do not have any narration saying that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam something and he made it for his uncle. All what we know is that he said, هذا عن محمد وعن آل بيتي. This is for Muhammad and all of his family. And we have another narration for Muhammad. وأمتي محمد. This is for Muhammad and all of the Ummah of Muhammad, all of Muslims. But we do not have a narration saying that he slaughtered something and said this is specifically for Hamza or this is specifically for Khadija, his first wife. No, nothing like that happened. We know that it's permissible to slaughter as a sadaqa for a dead person. My father is dead. I can slaughter a sheep as a sadaqa and just distribute it to needy people. A sadaqa. But that does, that does not have to be in the...